Okay, we're now looking at assessment component 2.2, and here we start to look at individualistic theories of criminality. This PowerPoint is going to look at a psychodynamic theory, that of Freud. We'll evaluate it, and then we're going to look at how Freud's psychodynamic theory has informed policy. So, let's start with a general introduction to individualistic theories, and in particular psychodynamic theories. So an individualistic theory of crime holds that crime is caused by individual differences based on someone's personality type or the experience that people have had within their lives. So individualistic proponents, uh, proponents of the individu individualistic theory of criminality argue that the root of crime is your individual makeup or the development processes that you've experienced within your life. It's your makeup, your development, childhood, etc., that causes you to be criminal. So, as I said, we can look at psychodynamic theories, which um, see our personality as containing active forces that cause us to act as we do. So, these forces are powerful urges, feelings, and conflicts within our unconscious mind. So they would argue that criminal behaviour is a result of an individual's failure to resolve these inner conflicts in a socially acceptable way. So here we go. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, 1856 to 1939. Let's uh, just a little introduction on Sigmund Freud. He was the founder of psychoanalysis and according to Freud, our early childhood experiences determine our personality and our future behaviour. His famous quote is, the child is the father to the man. So in other words, what you experience in childhood informs how you are as an adult. So Freud believed that our early experiences determine whether we will go on to act in antisocial ways. So let's look at Freud's key ideas. So Freud believed that all human beings have criminal tendencies. We've all got them, they're latent, they're within us, there's nothing we can do about it. However, most people develop some form of inner control that helps us to suppress these criminal tendencies and they, so they don't manifest themselves. Freud believed that it was your early childhood experiences that influenced your likelihood to commit crime. So it was your childhood that enabled you to develop these inner controls to stop your criminal tendencies. If your childhood uh, in some way was affected, then you didn't have the, uh, the way of suppressing the criminal tendencies. So it's all down to what you were as a child. This quote here sort of links how important Freud thought childhood was. In many criminals, especially youthful ones, it's possible to detect a very powerful sense of guilt which existed before the crime and is therefore not its result, but its motive. It's as if it was a relief to be able to fasten this unconscious sense of guilt onto something real and immediate. So, Freud believed there were three parts to each person's personality, psyche, the Greek word for soul, psyche, three parts, a tripartite view. There's the id, the ego, and the superego. And we're going to look at these, as I said, in more detail. And your criminal behaviour is a result of abnormal development of this psyche. You've got an unhealthy psyche if you've developed criminal behaviour because your childhood hasn't been healthy. So since the, the structure for Freud of the psyche is determined in the first five years of life, it therefore logically follows that the roots of offending are to be found in this period, especially the relationship between the developing child and its parents. So let's have a look at the psyche. So the psyche, as I said, is tripartite, consists of three parts, the id, which is to do with instincts, the ego, which is reality, and the superego, morality. So id, ego, superego. 
So let's have a look at these in more detail. Let's start with the id. Now, the id is present from birth up to 18 months. Freud called it the pleasure principle. And it's that childlike, selfish, animalistic part of your personality that wants instant gratification of its needs. It's that rather unpleasant part of you that you wouldn't pe want people to know know about yourself. It's that animalistic bit inside you. So it reflects those basic innate drives that all humans have. Pleasure seeking behavior, aggression, sexual impulses. So it's often portrayed as like the devil on your shoulder, that nasty little voice in your ear telling you to do bad things. It's those unconscious drives and instincts. And if we acted on these urges whenever we felt them, they would lead us into antisocial and criminal behaviour. If we then move towards the super, super ego, that develops between the age of three and six. It's the role of our conscience, which is why I've got Jiminy Cricket up here, who acted as Pinocchio's conscience because he didn't have one. It's learned through interactions with our parents during early socialisation within the family. For instance, we may be punished for trying to satisfy our urges without regards for others. One of the first things that parents are trying to teach children, say please, say thank you, share. It's all about suppressing those unpleasant urges which me, 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 I want, I want, which uh, come as uh, socialisation. As we socialise, we repress those urges. So it sort of provides our moral standards. So whereas the id is the devil on your shoulder, the superego is the angel on your shoulder. And the superego feels guilt and holds someone back from behaving in a certain way if it's thought to be wrong. It's that conscience part of you, stops you from behaving badly. And it internalizes the rules that are passed down from our parents, it internalizes the rules as we become socialized. And if we go against our superego, it punishes us by making us feel guilty and anxious. And the last part of our personality is the ego. And that develops between 18 months and three years, so between the id and the superego. And that's really called the reality principle, learning from experience that in the real world, our actions have consequences. The role of the ego is to strike a balance between the demands of the id and the constraints imposed by the superego. So in a well-adjusted person, the ego acts in a way that satisfies the id's desires, but is also morally acceptable to the ego, to the superego. So for example, here you've got the id saying, I want to do that now. And the superego going, well, it's not right to do that. And the ego in the middle going, well, maybe we can compromise. So, so the ego really, as we see in this illustration, is acting as a balance between the id and the superego. And if you want some more information on this, very good link to a, a video here on YouTube about, about all of this. Again, if you're watching this on my channel, you just have to pause and copy the link down. If you're watching it on my normal PowerPoint at school, just click on the link and you'll be fine. So, if you've got a healthy psyche, it's going to look something like this. You've got the ego saying, OK, guys, I'm in charge. Anything you want has to go through me. And you're just going, oh, OK. And you're super ego you're going, OK. And I put this up here because Freud believed that a lot of the mind is hidden. So it's like an iceberg. We see bits of the ego and bits of the super ego above the water. It's what we show to other people. And that's our conscious mind. But in our unconscious mind, we've got other bits of the ego, lots of the super ego, and of course the id hidden deep below. So you've got your id, which is like a child going, I want, I need, satisfy me. You've got the superego going, you can't, you must not, it's not allowed. 
and then you've got ego in the middle. So your id, the child, your super ego is acting like a parent and your ego is the rounded adult with the rounded psyche. So the id is your innate desire, your pleasure seeking aggression, sexual impulse, whereas your ego, uh, uh, your ego is your, uh, your super ego is your moral ethical values, your parental values, and then your mature adaptive behavior is demonstrated in the ego. Lots of different diagrams to do it, to show it in different ways. So how does all this link to crime? Well, psychoanalytical theories see antisocial behavior as caused by an abnormal relationship with parents during early socialization. For example, a child may be neglected or parents may be excessively lax or excessively strict. And this can result in either a weak or an over harsh or deviant superego. So if you have a weakly developed superego, that means the individual will feel less guilt about antisocial action and less inhibition about acting on the id's urges. So if you've got a, a weak superego, as we've got down here, you've got the id going, right, give me food now, then let's have some fun, find some drink and drugs and sex, I don't care how you get it. And the weak superego is going, sorry, it's wrong, sorry, it's wrong. And it can't be heard. And then the ego goes, OK, and off we go. So if you've got a too harsh and unforgiving superego, that would create deep seated guilt feelings in the individual who then craves punishment as a relief from these feelings. That person with a too harsh or unforgiving superego may engage in compulsive repeat offending, recidivism, in order to be punished. So it looks a little bit like this, you know, you've got the overdeveloped superego going, listen up, I'm in charge, you're not here to enjoy yourself, Get ready for a double sized portion of anxiety with a side order of guilt. And the id's go, no fun, and the he goes, just go, whimper. So um, that's how a, a, a too harsh or unforgiving superego might manifest itself. If we look at a deviant superego, that's one where the child is successfully socialized, but into a deviant moral code. So your son may have a perfectly good relationship with his criminal father. And so as a result of that good relationship with the criminal father, the son internalizes his father's criminal values. So as a result, his superego won't inflict guilt feelings on him for contemplating criminal acts. So it looks something like this. Um, the id's going, I'm hungry, get some food. Um, and, the, and the ego's going, well, we're skint guys. But I could always rob someone and super ego goes, well, OK, by me, because the uh, the it's been internalized, the father's criminality. And finally, we would have the psychopath where you might notice there's no super ego at all. You've just got the id going, OK, give me food. Then I want sex, lots of it. I don't particularly care whether it's with a willing partner. Then I want to hurt people badly probably be hungry again after that so and then the ego just goes okay then let's go because there's no control there whatsoever so hopefully that's explained Freud's theory of how uh, how um, lack of uh, an, an, under, an incorrectly developed psyche leads to criminality let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of his theory so firstly strengths well it's an important consideration of emotion so the psychodynamic approach is the only explanation for offending behavior that deals with the role of emotional factors. So it includes how anxiety and feelings of rejection may contribute to offending behavior. And there's a certain element of truth in that. And secondly, it recognizes the importance of childhood experiences. It, you know, it, it recognises how important early childhood experience are in moulding adult personalities. And this aspect of his theory has led to much, much research into crime and deviance as a result of this. So there's definitely some truth in this. If we move on to some of the weaknesses of Freud's position, well, many critics have doubted the existence of an unconscious mind. 
how can you actually prove there is an id or a superego uh, if it's unconscious? Uh, fair point. Um, and psychoanalytic explanations are unscientific and subjective. They rely on accepting the uh, psychoanalyst's claims that they can see into the workings of the individual's unconscious mind to discover their inner conflicts and motivations. But again, how do you prove that? So that then leads us on to looking how, at how psychodynamic theory, Freud's theory, has informed policy development. Um, now, obviously, psychoanalysis is uh, psychoanalysis is how it's informed policy development. Uh, prescribing prisoners, uh, criminals, psychoanalysis. So it's based on Freud's theory of personality. It highlights the unconscious conflicts between the id, the superego, and psychoanalysis sees a weak superego as a cause of criminality because the individual obviously lacks a moral force to curb their selfish instincts. They haven't got a conscience. And a weak superego can result, result from inadequate early socialization of the child. So it repeats Freud's theory. Treatment is very lengthy. Freud saw his patients five times a week, often for years. It involves bringing these unconscious conflicts and repressed emotions, remember that iceberg with the id and the superego deep underneath, into the conscious mind so they can be resolved. To access the unconscious mind, Freud used hypnosis and free association. That's where the analyst gives a patient a word and they respond with the first word that comes into their mind, word association. Um, August Eichhorn, this guy here, applied psychoanalytical ideas to policies for treating young offenders at the institution he supervised. He argued that because they had uncaring or absent parents, they'd failed to develop loving relationships. Normal socialization hadn't taken place and so they hadn't developed a superego. This is very similar to Bowlby's ideas that maternal deprivation could cause criminality and I'm going to be looking at Bowlby in my next PowerPoint. And so Icon just rejected the harsh environments of young offenders institutions at the time. So he was in the 1920s where you, it was like a ball stall, it was really unpleasant. And he actually treated the children by providing a happy and pleasant environment that would make development of the superego possible. So Icon's a really good example of how psychoanalysis was used to create a more pleasant environment uh, in offenders institutions. But the reality is that psychoanalysis doesn't seem to be very effective. ISENC found that only 44% of psychoanalysis patients treated for neurosis showed improvement as against 72% of patients treated by hospitals or GPs. And if psychoanalysis doesn't work for neurosis, it seems unlikely to work for criminals, who ISENC argues were likely to be neurotics. And psychoanalysis is costly, it's time consuming, so in reality, because of this, it's never been used on a large scale for treating criminals. And finally, one of the, one of the problems with psychoanalysis is its very nature, because it creates a power imbalance between the therapist and the client, and that potentially raises ethical issues. So that's our first individualistic theory of criminality, a psychodynamic theory, Sigmund Freud. Make sure you really understand the difference between the ego, the id, the superego, and how different, um, different either stronger or weaker forms of all of those three can relate to criminality. I hope you found this useful. Goodbye. <laughs>